begin to thank him tonight. Just worship him wherever you are. Worship him wherever you are. So let's 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 just calm down. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we have the privilege, the honor. In fact, privilege understatement. Rare privilege, even understatement. If there is a word to use, to have this man in our midst. The founder and president of ICMA globally. Founder and President of Power City International, Kingdom Life Network. My father. My father. Oh. <laughs> ah, 
Papa is a rare privilege. We are always very excited, always very, very happy whenever we see you in our midst. And words are not enough to show you how appreciative we are. And I want to say thank you, sir, for coming. And all the Ikma people. And you are just sitting down like that. We are very happy that you are here. Even in the midst of your busy schedule and with everything going on in the world, you said you have to be with us. We say thank you. We don't take it for granted at all. Thank you so much, sir. I want everybody, if you are not already, stand on your feet. Let us welcome to the podium the one and only Global Baba. Glory! Glory! Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Father, we rejoice. And we thank you for the privilege. The privilege of fellowship. The privilege of looking into the perfect law of liberty. We rejoice that tonight we are found in you. And thank you for this opportunity to learn. This weekend is dedicated to insight and revelation knowledge from your word. We speak words which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual. And we rejoice that your people are built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus is glorified. Thank you that by the end of this weekend, nobody lives here the same way they came. We give you praise and glory. Ministries will flourish more than ever before. Clarity comes for callings and elections. Clarity comes for this assignment and for all that you will have your people do in the days to come and in the weeks to come and in the years to come. And we rejoice that everyone will be fully aligned into the purpose, the plan, and the pursuit of God. Le koto sakala daha. Jekolo. Nekroto sakala. Egere to saka. Bebro, Nako, Nege, Lene, Mako, Sakea, Egebajo, Koloto, Mekeline, Maha, Legros, Sakele, Rebaba, Mebrona, Conto, Legrono, Sukala, Namamra, Rekotona, Egere, Nika, Gagoro, To, Sakele, Egele, Nemambro, Gadozo, Kolo, Namaha, Ega, Beboro, Koto, Sukele, Rebrena, Bebrena, Gede, Gegele, Nema, Koroto, Suka, Karana, Maha, Praise you, Father. This environment is error-free. And we rejoice that your word comes with precision, accuracy, and wholeness. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Please, you can be seated with your sweet, smart self. I'm excited to be in Christ's Rehoboth again. And I'm glad to be with Reverend Kingsley. We love you, man. So, so, such a blessing you are to the body of Christ, and a blessing you are to this house, and a blessing you are to the assignment of Jesus Christ. That is why I came. Because of your heart for the gospel and your heart for Christ, and because of your honor of Jesus. That's why I came. You know, uh, many people wonder how I was able to get time to come. There are relationships that even when there is no time, you make time for. You know, uh, that's what it is. It's relationship. And uh, I treasure relationship, especially relationships that are built on the message of Christ. I honor such relationships. Because honoring them is honoring Christ. So I'm glad to be with you, man. I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you. Let's celebrate him. <laughs> celebrate him. You know, and, uh, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be in this conference. You'll be glad you did. Yeah, it's 
going to be an exciting weekend, every one of you. If you have friends that are not here, please reach out to them and tell them to do themselves one singular honor to be here. Reach out to them. It's going to be exciting. You'll be glad you came. Things are going to shift in your life. Yeah. There are going to be alignments, divine alignments. Yes, the Lord already told me, so it's, it's, it's not a prayer point. I'm announcing to you what is going to happen. There will be divine alignment. Yeah. I'm, I'm fully persuaded. Amen. 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 All right, sit it down. Sit it down. Um, <laughs> we came with a number of my books, and I'll, glad, I'll be glad you get them. They will help you a lot. This is the latest one I just wrote. Every man a minister responding to the call of God. Very powerful. You'll be glad to get. And all of them are here. A lot of new books. They're the office of the pastor. The last days. And, you know, the communion table. Uh, myth, causes, myth and the truth. All of that, they're useful to you. Every local church has a direction of the spirit of God. Every local church has a direction of the spirit of God for it. There is no general direction for all the churches. Every local assembly has a direction of the spirit of God for it. And the pastor who is the person God has placed over the flock, the pastor, not pastors, the pastor, there can be no two pastors over a local church. That would be a monster. The pastor whom God has placed over that flock. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, please put it up for me on the screen. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Brother Paul writes to the elders in Ephesus. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. And take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. So he purchased the church with his own blood and the Holy Ghost selects men to be overseers over the church which the blood of God was used in purchasing. Yeah, all right? Which the Holy Ghost has made you overseer. So you have that responsibility as a pastor to feed the flock, to feed the flock. And this feeding of the flock is by the Holy Ghost. And it's not your duty. It's by the Holy Ghost. Remember the theme of this conference is training, evangelism, and discipleship. So I'm going to be very, very frontal with you with the truth of the commission. Today we have the luxury of being exposed to the media, social media, and all of the various platforms where you are exposed to great men of God in the body of Christ, used of God for the body of Christ. But you see, everyone needs to know where they are. You cannot be everywhere. To be everywhere is to be nowhere. To be everywhere is to lack direction. There are many mighty men of God all over the world but the Holy Ghost did not place all of them over you as overseers. Mm -mm. That's chaos. That's confusion. And God is the God of order. Okay? So everybody can't be your pastor. Every man of God cannot be your pastor. It doesn't matter how much you love them. It doesn't matter how much you like them. It doesn't matter how much you're excited about them. Every man of God cannot be your pastor. That would be confusion. That would be chaos. That will be a monster having more than one head. All right? So that's why I say, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. And when the Holy Ghost makes you an overseer over a flock, you have the responsibility.
to feed the flock. And the flock has the responsibility to be fed by you. To be fed by you. A child that eats from different houses, when he starts purging, we will not know where the purging is coming from. When you are eating from everywhere, the moment you start purging and having issues with your stomach, we won't know which of the food purged you. But when you are eating from one place and you purge, we will know which particular food you ate to avoid that food next time. So the Holy Ghost cannot make you to be under more than a pastor. He makes a pastor over a congregation. Moses said, let the Lord God set a man over a congregation. A man over a congregation. So everybody must be able to be somewhere, not everywhere. It's true. You belong to the body of Christ universal. But you are planted in a local assembly. You belong to the body of Christ universal, but you are planted in a local assembly. Now, you observe the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3. The letters were written to the angel of the church, not angels, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. To the angel of the church in Simna. Not to the angels. To the angel. Specific. And the letter was addressed to the angel who is the pastor of the church. The writer of Revelation used a lot of language that requires explanation and interpretation. When he says to the angel, he's talking about to the messenger. Because the word angel means messenger. And the angel or God's messenger to a church is the pastor. So that later of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, we are letters of indictments to the angel, to the churches in Asia Minor that had gone into apostasy. And so through the angel, the vision was given to John to send letters of warning to those churches because they were in a state of apostasy. Apostasy means they left the message of Christ and they had started going back to legalism. Remember, the churches in Asia Minor were churches started by Brother Paul. So they were apostolic churches, but they left apostolic foundations and began to compromise the standard of apostolic teachings and instructions. So they were written letters to warn them and they were told if they do not de desist from their compromise, the candlestick will be taken out of the churches. Now, if you read chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, observe, there were instructions to the angel of the church, and there were instructions to him that overcome it. So, two classes of people were addressed. The angel of the church and the believers that overcome. But remember, the book of Revelation was written by Brother John. And John wrote the epistle of First John, Second John, and Third John as a doctrinal framework for the explanation of the book of Revelation. So when he says to him that overcometh, brother John now will say in First John chapter five verse four, "Who is he that overcometh? But him that believeth that Jesus is the Christ." So every believer in Jesus is the overcomer. It's not like after you are born again, there is another overcoming. Being born again is the overcoming. So he was addressing saints that had overcome by faith in Christ, and he was addressing the churches. Now, if you observe. All of those churches are gone because their candlestick were taken away from them. Because apostasy never departed from those churches, but the believers in them were overcomers. I don't know if I'm communicating at all. The churches were shut down, but the believers were overcomers. Now, there's a reason why I took you to Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and that is the issue there to the angel of the church. The issues in Corinth are not the issues in Galatia. The issues in Galatia are not the issues in Philippi. The issues in Philippi are not the same issues in Corinth. Every church, therefore, has specific apostolic instructions and has specific direction that will be emphasized.
emphasize at a certain point in time. There are things that the Holy Ghost will lay in the heart of the overseer of a local congregation at one point or the other specifically for that congregation. It's not for the body of Christ. And each church has such emphasis from time to time. Why? Because God deals with that local congregation through the overseer of that local congregation as an entity that a ministry has been apportioned to communicate with. Am I communicating at all? Now, so sometimes in your local church, when you begin to emphasize something, someone somewhere is wondering, is this not too much? You are not in that local church. How is it your business that there is emphasis? You are not a part of that audience. The message appertained not to you. You have no capacity to understand where they are coming from because there is a context in which that emphasis is being communicated and those who belong to that congregation understand exactly what is being said. Am I communicating at all? Yeah, because this is specific instruction and emphasis to a particular local audience. That's why nobody is called to the body of Christ. Nobody is called to the body of Christ. Everybody is called to a specific location. There's no such assignment. <laughs> Call to the body of Christ. No. It is true that when you bless the local assembly, there will be an overflow to the body of Christ. But the specific target is the local assembly. The specific target is the local assembly. So you need to realize that there is a focus in every local assembly. Are you still here? You need to also realize that Brother Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse number 18. Brother Paul is speaking to Timothy. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee that thou by them might as war a good warfare. He didn't say, Timothy, go around collating prophecies. Mm -mm. There are specific prophecies that we put on you because we have oversight over you. Take those prophecies and use them to war a good warfare. Specifics. Please stay with me. That's not picking up prophecies around the body of Christ. He said specific prophecies have gone on you. That with them you wage a good warfare. So in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 14. He now says to Timothy. Neglect not the gift of God which is in you. Which was given you by prophecy. With the laying on of the hands of the elders. That is in the local assembly. Prophecies came on you. And elders laid hands on you. To establish those prophecies. Now by them. War a good warfare and do not neglect what was put on you. You must realize, Timothy, that you are not ordinary. You must realize, Timothy, there's an affirmation of divine deposit upon your life for a particular assignment to the body of Christ beginning from a local assembly. So, neglect not. Look down not on those prophecies. You may not look like the prophecies now. But those prophecies are already a roadmap to where you're arriving at. So don't neglect them. Are we together here? Specific prophecies, specific prophecies have gone on on you by the laying on of the hands of the elders you've been established. In 2 Timothy 1.6, he now says, Tear up the gift of God, tear up the gift of God, which was given thee by laying on of hands, or by brother Paul laying hands on you. Tear it up. That is something you are carrying. You just need to tear it up. It is not going to come. It's already there. All you need to do is tear it up because it is in tearing it up that you, it will be of benefit benefit to the people of God. Are we still here? Now, there are prophecies that are general for the body of Christ. We hold on to them. It's fine. But in your local assembly, there are things that are emphasized. There are things that are emphasized. 
I'm sure there are emphasis, brother. I mean, Pastor Kingsley has been bringing to this house in the last one year. Emphasis, emphasis, emphasis. And those of us who are pastors here, there are emphasis you've been bringing to your local assembly. There are times in your local assembly, you sense the need to set their focus on the revelation of Christ. Then there are times you sense the need to remind them of their identity. Then there are times you sense the need to push them towards prayer. There are times you sense the need to stir up the people towards love for one another. There are times, so different emphasis per time by the Holy Ghost. Because you can't do all at the same time. So it has to be by the Spirit to know what ought to be done at a particular point in time. Are we still here? Now, Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 to 20. I'm about to begin. Matthew 28 verse 18 to 20. Jesus in Matthew 28, 18 to 20 after resurrection. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. I can stay there for the next three days. In heaven and on earth. When Jesus said in heaven and on earth, his immediate audience understood that he was reading from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Because Jesus preached from Moses. Remember, after the resurrection, beginning at Moses, always. Jesus always started his teachings from Moses. So when he rose from the dead and he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. He was reading from somewhere. And that was from Genesis. All right. Now, so having shown them that what I'm saying is not a coinage that came from resurrection. I am saying what has been there from Genesis. That even from Genesis, by prophecy, it was already documented that there will be an amalgamation of heaven and earth. That there was going to be a unification of heaven and earth. That is Kabayata. That God's plan was that heaven and earth should be together. But the sin of man separated heaven from earth. So the death of Christ restored heaven and earth together. So Jesus is saying, I operate heaven and earth. And in both heaven and earth, power belongs to me. That is to say, immortality will be amalgamated with mortality. That is to say, heaven takes residence on earth. That is to say, God and man will be unified as an entity. Jacobaya, heaven and earth. All power, both in heaven and earth, is given to me. Now, observe the next verse. Next verse. Next verse. Go ye therefore. Hey, go ye therefore. The basis for going therefore is that heaven and earth has been united and all authority in that realm belongs to Jesus. And what belongs to Jesus belongs to you. So on the basis of that, go ye therefore. Kabayada, the church is on the go. From the time he told you to go, he never told you to come back. It is an eternal go. Go ye therefore and teach. Underline the word teach. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Next verse. Teaching. Teach. Teaching. Emphasis. Teach. Teaching. Emphasis. That what we call the Great Commission is a teaching commission. <laughs> yeah. Teach. Teaching. <laughs> you cannot produce matured believers without teaching. Mm -mm. Teach. Teaching. Emphasis. Teaching them to observe all things. 
Not some things. All things. Whatsoever I have commanded you. So the question is commanded from where? Keep that somewhere. Whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo. Nekorotosaka. <laughs> And lo, I am with you till the end of the world. I am, not I will be. I am with you. I thought when Jesus rose from the dead, Luke's account said... The disciples saw him caught up in the cloud. And disappeared. Sitting at the right hand of God. I thought that's what they said they saw. <laughs> but the master himself said, I go nowhere. It doesn't matter what they saw. The master himself said, Lo, look, see, behold, I'm going nowhere. I am coming into you. I'm not going to a planet somewhere. I'm not flying to an, a, a, a geographical location somewhere. Uh -uh. I am with you. Dabayana, till the end of the world. Amen. So he never left. No, he never left. He never left. Oh yes, he never left. Somebody said, but they say he went to the right hand of God. Right hand doesn't mean right hand. Right hand means regency. He occupied the place of authority. And that place of authority is in the heavenlies. And the heavenlies is in the believer. He rose from the dead to come on your inside. Glory to God. He lives in you. <laughs> he lives in you. Turn to your neighbor and say, days of heaven on earth. I hear right now. Glory. Hi. Please sit down. Let's push a little more. Mm -mm. Remember in John chapter 14, he told them, John chapter 14, before he died, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go for you. Yeah. I go for you. I'm not going for me. I don't need going. But I go for you. Are we in the building? Next verse. And if I go for who? For you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself. You wouldn't come to me. I will receive you. The gospel is not come to God. The gospel is God has come to you. The gospel is God has come to you. I go and I will come to you and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Now this is pre-resurrection. This was an announcement of the schedule of death, burial, resurrection and ascension. Where I am, you will be. And lo, I am with you always. Till the end of the earth. Why? Where I am, you will be. So 
where he is, I am right now. Are we teaching good tonight? Okay, please sit down. Let's push a little now. <clears throat> in my father's house, in my father's oikia, there are many monies. Now, religious leaders who have refused to have respect for scriptural interpretation will tell you there's a building somewhere. And they do not consider even the English. You don't find mansions in a house. It's not houses in a mansion. It is mansion in a house. It doesn't make English sense. So, which means that is not English communication. That is Bible language. You go to the original, in my father's oikia, that's the Greek word, there are many monies. Oikia is O-I-K-I-A. Mone is M-O-N-E. Oikia means in my father's household. Household. In my father's family, there are many dwelling places. There are many spaces. Huh. There are many spaces. There are many spaces. There are many spaces. I and my father <laughs> will come into you and make our abode with you. There are many spaces. There are many spaces. Yadaba. In my father's family, there are many spaces. Are we teaching here? You are built up a spiritual house. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? In my father's Oikia, there are many monies. Are we teaching now? Yes. Yeah. So all power is given to me. Go, go, go. Because you are not going away from me. I will never leave you. I will live in you. I will walk in you. I will be your God. You will be my sons and daughters. So go. And in your going, I am with you. Mark 16, 20. Mark chapter 16, verse number 20. Mark 16, 20. Look at what Jesus said upon his resurrection. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them. The Lord walking well with them. Why? <laughs> Lo, I am with you always. So as they went everywhere, he was walking with them. Why? He never left. So when they laid hands on the sick, who was laying hands on the sick? The Lord. When they cast out demons, who was casting out demons? The Lord. When he walked the face of the earth in the incarnation, did any demon disobey him? So how much more in the resurrection? He opened blind eyes in the incarnation. He commanded the lame to walk in the incarnation. Demons saw him and cried out in the incarnation. Now in the resurrection, he has taken up residence inside you. So when you move, demons should be crying out. Yeah, when you speak to the sick, they should get healed. Look, listen, expect them to be healed. When you speak, expect why? Because it's not you, it's the Lord walking with you, confirming his word with signs and wonders following. Am I teaching here? The Lord walking with them. Nekotabosh. Nekotabosh. 
Now, let's look at something that corroborates Luke 24, 25 to 27. Remember, there was a conversation on the way to Emmaus uh, between Cleopas and arguably theologians believe that the second person was Cleopas' wife. So they were on their way to Emmaus and they were discussing the event of the past three days. Jesus walked in their midst and said, gentlemen, what are you guys talking about? And they turned and said, are you a stranger in town? Have you not heard about Jesus? They were preaching Jesus to Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus. Have you not heard of the good guy, Jesus, the Messiah that was killed? We thought he was the one that would restore the kingdom to Israel. Have you heard about this kingdom takeover? Okay. All those kind of, those, those, those uncooked revelations. Kingdom takeover. And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. No, if my kingdom were to be of this world, a legion of angels would have taken over the whole parameters. Yeah, he said, when will you restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it is not in your power to know, but the one you have power is, is go and be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. That is where the kingdom takes over in the hearts of men. Are we teaching here? Now, so, Jesus now looked at them and called them fools. Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now, the entire conversation is from the text of the Old Testament, as we now call it. Okay, Because um, there's no such thing in the Bible called Old Testament and New Testament. It was done by translators. Okay, It wasn't inspired of God. It's translators who demarcated the book and said Genesis is Old Testament. Matthew down is, is not in the original. Okay, now, But for the purpose of the teaching, we can call it Old Testament since you have an idea of what I'm saying now. Now, so the entire discourse was from the Old Testament as we call it now. Now, that Luke chapter 24, verse 44, put it up for me. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled. Which were written in the law of Moses. Always, that's how Jesus started teaching. And that's the way the apostles also taught. And that's how we are supposed to teach. Okay? In the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Next verse. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now that word, that word is dinogiosunemi. If you observe, there are two understanding and understand in one verse. In English language, understanding and understand are saying the same thing. In the Greek, it's not the same. That's why Bible interpretation is of the essence. In English, you would think, understand, understand. But in the Greek is a word, then opened he their dinogio, that they might soon me the scriptures. He opened their dinogio. The word dinogio means for the first time, their mind split open. And the word sunemi means when he collected the facts together and arrived at a destination. The moment Jesus collected the facts of the scriptures together and arrived at a destination, their mind split open to see for the first time that, whoa, so this is what the scriptures were about. Are you following? Dinegio. For those of you making notes, I can give you the spelling so you don't go and write something funny. D-I-A D-I-A-N-O-G-E-O Dinegio. The next word is Sunemi. S-U-N-E-M-I. Sunemi. He opened... He burst forth in their understanding. He flashed a new light in their understanding. 
the word knows that is the way they used to think Tsunami means to synchronize the scriptures together. He synchronized the scriptures together. And when the scriptures were synchronized, suddenly what they have been reading all their life came alive. And their understanding could capture it. Now, look at verse 46 of the same chapter. Luke 24, 46. Please pay attention. And said unto them, thus... It is written that and thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Next verse. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Next verse. Oh, glory to God. And you are witnesses of these things. Next verse. Glory to God. And behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So we have legitimate evidence that Jesus is teaching from the Old Testament. And we found that legitimacy that he was teaching from Genesis to Malachi. Like you know, and if you don't know, you need to know. The first way to understand when someone is teaching is you must use his textbook. <laughs> if someone is teaching, you must use the same textbook he's using. I can't be teaching you from an Greek textbook and you are reading a chemistry textbook. And you will understand what I am saying. You must read the same textbook. So if Jesus is teaching from Genesis to Malachi. For you to understand what Jesus is teaching. You must use Genesis to Malachi. Not just that. You must sit where they sat. And hear what they heard. <laughs> you can't sit where you are sitting. To understand what they heard. When you didn't hear what they heard. You, that's the problem. That's why sometimes you hear people on social media arguing and fighting and tearing their clothes. Because you brought out a light that they have not sat where you sat to hear what you heard. So they are expecting that if what you are saying is true, they should have heard it where they are sitting. Uh -uh. You can't sit where you sit to hear what I heard where I sat. If you're going to hear what I heard where I sat, you must sit where I sat and hear what I heard to understand what I'm saying. I don't know if I'm communicating at all. So you cannot use a different textbook from your teacher's textbook and understand what your teacher is teaching. Mm -mm. So when, when Jesus taught them, the audience, the immediate audience understood what he was saying because they were sitting where he was teaching from. But today's audience must also go back and sit where they sat and hear what they heard. Am I teaching? Please stay with me. All right? Now, the first thing here is this is an instruction from the Old Testament. Go ye and make disciples. Of all nations. Where. Is that instruction coming from? The Old Testament. <laughs> you know last week. I, I was preaching back at home. On reflecting the father. Reflecting the father. And I said to them in church. If God was not father in the Old Testament. He cannot be father in the New Testament. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, He couldn't have been uncle in the Old Testament and be born again to be father in the New Testament. <laughs> so if Jesus taught the fatherhood of God in the New Testament, where was he teaching from? The Old Testament. So that means the concept of God being a father is an Old Testament teaching. There is more New Testament in Old Testament than there is in New Testament. Because the New Testament came out of the Old Testament. 
Are we in the building here? Stay with me, please. So, go ye and make disciples of all nations is in the Old Testament. The instruction to teach them, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the world is in the Old Testament. Jesus didn't just coin something. Everything Jesus did was according to the scriptures. The death was according to the scriptures. The burial was according to the scriptures. The resurrection was according to the scriptures. Everything he taught was according to the scriptures. He didn't bring a new syllabus. He only came to rightly divide the Old Testament and bring out the realities that concerned him and bring it to fulfillment. So a good Bible teacher and a good Bible preacher must be able to teach where Jesus taught from. You must. If you cannot teach where Jesus taught from, you will not be holistic in your teaching. You know, one of the problems with um, some of the people who are Christocentric and some of the people who are finished work teachers is a fact that they are not thorough when it comes to the Old Testament. That's where the problem is. That's where the lacuna is. Some of them are not thorough with the Old Testament. So they just say, we throw away the Old Testament. We are New Testament people. <laughs> but New Testament is Old Testament. Old Testament is New Testament. Because Old Testament is New Testament concealed. New Testament is Old Testament revealed. So new and old is the same. There are no two New Testaments. We don't have two Testaments. There are no two Testaments. The moment you start thinking of two testaments, you're thinking of two gods. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. <laughs> and there can be no consistency in that. There's only one God. There is no Old Testament God and New Testament God. It's not like God was a bad boy in the Old Testament. He became born again in the New Testament. No, he never changes. This Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. So whatever he was in the Old Testament is what he is in the New Testament. So if his standard for the Old Testament was this. It will still be the same in the New Testament. So there are no two New Testaments. I mean there are no two, new, two Testaments. We have only one Testament. So the question would be. So where did the Old Testament and New Testament come from? Like I told you in the beginning. Translators. There is only one Testament. God does he have double standards. He has only a singular standard. That's why it will look like God said kill in the Old Testament. Then when he came to the New Testament, he said forgive. Because you're thinking of two gods. One Old Testament God with a very scary face. Thou shall not. Touch not. Then in the New Testament, come unto me. Only that labor and a heavy laden. I am the good shepherd. The guy is born again now. No, there can't be two. He's only one. The same yesterday, today, and forever. I, the Lord, I change it not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Here are you, O Israel. Our God is one Lord. So why does it sound like there are two testaments? No, there are not two. This is one. God has just one testament. And Moses has another testament. <laughs> so it's God's testament and man's testament. Did you understand what I just said? Uh, Romans chapter <laughs> chapter 3 verse 15. Romans uh, chapter 3. Did I say Romans? I mean Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 verse 15. Oh, I just realized I need to lay all of this foundation so that what I'm going to be saying will really, will really settle well. All right? Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant. Whose covenant? A man's covenant. Yet, if it be confirmed, no man disannul it or added thereto. So we have a man's covenant and we have God's covenant. That's why it looks like two. 
If you understand that, you'll be a happy man. John 5, 45. Let me give you a bit of corroboration. John 5, 45. <clears throat> Glory to God. John chapter 5, verse 45. Brother on the computer, bless you. This weekend, I'm going to drag you a bit. Do not think. This is Jesus talking. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you. Even Moses, in whom you trust. So Moses is the accuser of the brethren. This is Jesus speaking. Do not think that I, Jesus, will accuse you to the Father. Mm -mm. I do not accuse. I have never accused. There's no accusation in my character. I'm not a fault finder. No. I have said your sins and iniquities. I remember them again. No more. I cannot be accusing you for what I have forgotten. There is one who will accuse you. Even Moses in whom you trust. Shataba. Next verse. Oh, you will love this. Can we all read together, everybody? Want to go. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. It seems Moses wrote two things. It seems Moses wrote two things. Accusation and Christ. So in Genesis, there is accusation and Christ. In Exodus, there is accusation and Christ. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, accusation and Christ. So what does a pastor do? Rightly divide. Take out accusation, bring Christ. I don't know if I'm communicating at all. Remember, though it be but a man's covenant. Now, so let's give it a bit more of corroboration. Matthew chapter 19 verse number 3. Matthew chapter 19 verse number 3. Matthew chapter 19 verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Next verse. And he answered and said unto them, have you not read anaginosko? The Greek word. That is, have you been reading without paying attention? Because he, he, they, they, they couldn't have been Pharisees if they have not read. For you to even be a Pharisee, you must know the Torah by heart. So they have memorized the entire Torah and they are saying it by heart. So he now said to them, gentlemen, have you not read the Greek word anaginosko? It means, have you not read attentively and intelligently? He's not saying, have you not read mm -mm, the, the anaginosko? A-N-A, -A, anaginosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. Anaginosko. Have you not read attentively and intelligently? Because they have read. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Jesus is quoting from Genesis chapter 2. Okay, next verse. And said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the twin shall be one flesh. Next verse. Wherefore, they are no more twin but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let no man put asunder. Now you know that that is not in Genesis. That addition there was from Jesus. It's not in Genesis. That requires explanation. So keep it somewhere in case we arrive there eventually. Okay? What therefore God had joined together, let no man put asunder. 
Look at the intelligence here. Verse 7. Please pay attention. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? You know what they are saying to Jesus? Why is there a contradiction between Moses and God? Why will God say what he has joined together? Put not asunder. Then Moses will now come as a messenger of God and say, put asunder. So now, they are quoting from Deuteronomy 24. Jesus is quoting from Genesis 2, which precedes Deuteronomy. In the sequential arrangement of the scriptures, Genesis precedes Deuteronomy. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. I tell you. Look at the way he answered them. Next verse. Oh, he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, sclerocardian. Sclerocardian means in view. Moses, in view or Moses in response or Moses as a reflection Moses saw what was in your heart and Moses knew that even if he tells you not to do it you will not hear him so in view of your heart took what was in your heart and permitted you to execute Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from Genesis, it was not so. Though it be but a man's covenant. A man's covenant. So there is God's covenant and there is man's covenant. There is grace, there is works. Grace, God, works, man. There is Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. Sinai, man. Zion, God. Eh? Are you following? There is the ministry of death the ministry of condemnation and the ministry of death. Then there is a ministry of the spirit. There is this ministry of life and the ministry of righteousness. Teaching good. This is Ikma, right? So, it is now the job of the man of God to trace Sinai, remove condemnation, Remove. Death. Remove. Later. Remove. Man's covenant. Remove. The ministry of righteousness. Feed the people of God. Life. Feed the people of God. Spirit. Feed the people of God. Zion. Feed the people of God. The two cannot work together. What saith it? Cast out the bondwoman. For the bondwoman and her son shall not inherit an allegory. An allegory. Mount Zion is the mother of us all. Sinai is in Arabia. And it gender it to bondage. Are you following? Don't worry. If you lose me, get the CD and listen again. I'm feeling whatever it is. So, Jesus thought from Genesis. Rightly divided Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was his teaching material. And he expects you today to teach from where he taught. Yeah. You can't teach anything else other than what he taught. 
Otherwise, you're not his messenger. Go ye and make disciples. Now, the instruction to teach them or to make them observe whatsoever I have told you and lo, I am with you always to the end of the world. If it is not in the Old Testament, that instruction, then Jesus is not Christ. And if Jesus is not Christ, I have no reason to listen to him. What validates what Jesus was saying was that he was speaking from the Old Testament books, what we call the Torah or the canon, Genesis to Malachi, the canon of scripture. Now, but if it is there, and Luke gives us the evidence that whatever Jesus taught was from the Old Testament beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He diharmonia expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So the first thing is, it is right there in the Old Testament. Number two, Jesus is teaching, making disciples from the Old Testament. Jesus is teaching them to make disciples from the Old Testament. The word making disciple is the Greek word matatheo. Mat, mat, like you have mathematics. Matatheo. M-A-T-H-T-E-U-O. The word there has to do with training people. Matatheo. Train. Make people students. Make them students. Matatheo. Go and make people learners. Turn them into students to train others, making them disciples from every nation. And that statement is it, it is continuous. It continues. That is, keep making disciples, keep making of every nation. The making of disciples never ends, it's an ongoing process till we see Jesus. Matthew 13, 52. Please stay with me now. Matthew chapter 13, verse number 52. Matthew 13, 52. Then said he unto them, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. Therefore, every scribe which is instructed the word instructed is the word matthew instructed to make people students to make people respond to instructions instructed there is the word matthew the first thing is that we are born again into the kingdom of god by faith in jesus John chapter 3 verse 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then Jesus emphasized John chapter 3 verse 5, except a man be born of water, symbolic, born of water, symbolic of newness. When you hear water, he is using a symbol to communicate that this birth is newness. Except a man be born of water, that is the spirit. So the water is symbolic of the spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He's not talking of three different things. He's talking of the same thing. Born again or symbolically born of water which arrives at being born of the spirit. It's a mode of communication. He's still saying the same thing. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. How is that born again going to happen? In the same context, John chapter 3, verse 3 and 5, if you go down to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So how is born again going to happen? By believing in the sacrificial work of Christ. He gave his only son to die. When you believe in that, you have everlasting life. That's how to be born again. So now you are born into 
Genoa anatim, the Greek word. Genoa anatim. For those of you making notes, it's G-E-N-A-O. Genoa anatim. A-N-A-T-I-M. Genoa anatim. You are born into. You are born into the kingdom of God. This is not referring to that alone. He is saying you are not only born into the kingdom. You are instructed into the kingdom of God making disciples. You are instructing people into the kingdom of God. Please stay with me. In other words, the kingdom of God is no more referring to an event here. The kingdom of God is no more referring to a place. Mm -mm. It's not an event. It's not a place. One day in the book of Luke, the disciples were looking for the kingdom. And Jesus said to them, the kingdom does not come by observation. The kingdom is among you. That is, I am that kingdom that you have read about. Now the kingdom has arrived. The kingdom is here. Jesus is the embodiment of God's kingdom. And when he showed up, the kingdom came. So we're not praying for the kingdom to come. The kingdom has already come. What is the kingdom? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That is the kingdom of God. And Jesus is our righteousness. He's our peace. Jesus is our Holy Ghost. That is the kingdom of God. So you right now possess on your inside God's kingdom. When you move, the kingdom is moving. When you talk, the kingdom is talking. Jato Balata. Kingdom means king's domain. It's talking about reigning. The reign of Christ in the heart of the believer. And the reign of the believer over circumstances, situations, demons and devils. Because the believer has received the abundance of grace which is the gift of righteousness therefore because he has received the righteousness of God in Christ he now reigns in this life over devils, demons, circumstances situations he does not take color from the environment he superimposes color on the environment he dominates this world because of what he carries on his inside somebody shout I hear you now stay with me so the kingdom of God is now activities. The kingdom of God is now activities that includes number one, instructions. Number one, instructions. Number two, dealings. Number three, culture. The kingdom of God is now activities which includes instructions, Dealings, culture, ethos, ethos, and on and on. Matthew 27, 57. Please put it up for me. Matthew chapter 27, verse 57. Matthew chapter 57, verse 27, verse 57. 27, 57. When the evil was come, there came a rich man. Rich man, rich man of Aramatel, named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He was not a member of Jesus' church. He was not a fan. He was a disciple. Remember, remember, he was a rich man. He brought his riches and made them nothing before Jesus and submitted to be instructed. He made himself a disciple. Take note of that. Pay attention to the phrases. The word Matthew there refers to he was being trained. A multi-millionaire coming to be trained. It shows you that he was found in the process of being trained. Notice what he calls him. 
the first time, I mean text we read, scribes were Jesus' disciples. Who are scribes? Authoritative people. Authoritative people made themselves Jesus' disciples. Do you know why those words are important? A scribe is an authority when it comes to the teaching of the scriptures. A scribe. Yeah, people like Nicodemus, rulers. Yet they made themselves disciples. They made themselves disciples. I've told them back home, if you come to our church to join our church, even if you're an apostle, the moment you arrive at the gate of power city, remove the title, give it to the gate man to keep for you. Walk into the service like a nobody because we don't know you as an apostle. We were not there when you were given the title and we don't know how you got it. So drop it at the gate. Enter here and sit down like everybody else and take notes. If you like, when going, you can collect the title from the gate. But the next time you arrive, drop it there. We do not give you a special seat in our church because you have a title. We don't care where you came from. As long as you have come to submit to our teaching, we treat you like a baby in Christ for status. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking at all. I, 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 I'm not joking at all. I'm not joking at all. Because this thing is beyond titles. What we're dealing with is beyond titles. The fathers that we are trying to correct what they taught us, they had all the titles in the world, yet they messed us up. So leave titles now. Let's face the book. It's not titles. I have told them. There are a number of them in our church who are reverends, reverend doctor. They are there. You won't know that they have ever read the Bible before. I'm not joking. I'm, not, I'm serious. We even have somebody who came to our, our, our class, one of our class, and said, look, Dr. Damina, I have PhD theology. And I didn't know what I read and got PhD for until I sat down under you. I don't know what to do with the PhD. I say, keep it. It will be handy someday. <laughs> keep it somewhere. <laughs> Don't throw it away. <laughs> you may need it somewhere. <laughs> the truth is this. When you come face to face with the realities of the gospel of Christ, religion suddenly becomes nothing. That's the truth. So as a pastor, as an overseer of God's people, you must know that it doesn't matter. That's why Jesus disciples scribes. You know, it's like the, the, the young man. Whom Aquila and eh? mighty in scriptures, knowing only that's where the lacuna is. Aquila and Priscilla say, Young man, calm down, calm down, calm down. All this gra gra you're doing all over, calm down. Come, let's help you. Let's help you now before little boys will disgrace you in the future. Come, come, come. And he was humble enough to close down his ministry, carry his suitcase, and follow them. The Bible says they sat him down and taught him the way of God more perfectly. That is the word anacrino. That is they gave him polished instructions without ambiguity. So by the time he came back, ayada, Bible says he mightily convinced the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. It was no more mighty in scriptures now. It was now unveiling Christ from the scriptures. There's a realm beyond quoting scriptures. It is the realm of revealing Christ. <laughs> Understandest thou what thou readest? The man said, how can I? Except some man should guide me. And Philip sat him down beginning from where he was reading. When you understand the scriptures, you don't change where they are reading. Anywhere you meet them reading, you reveal Christ from there. You must have mastery over the book that you can bring Christ out of any, any place of scripture. Even if it is offerings in Leviticus, you bring Christ out. And that's why discipleship is of the essence. Discipleship is critical. You cannot, you cannot assume that you are a disciple until you are discipled. There's no assumption in these things. 
Because why are you running to? Sometimes it's good to calm down and slow down. So you don't get to the front and do what you should have done five years ago. And of course, it's not just that you are the one that will now be correcting. You will have destroyed some people on the way. That may never be recovered. So it's just better to calm down and learn. And be patient. Be patient. Jesus is not coming tomorrow. The work is still enormous. So take your time. Take your time. Until we all come. So there's a, there's a huge assignment. Somebody shout, I hear you. Alright, now. So, a scribe submitted to Jesus as disciples. A rich man is an authority when it comes to money. So authority of scriptures submitted. Authority in the economy submitted as disciples. Which means that they are now being reschooled. They are being reschooled. Because they were already schooled. But when they encountered Jesus, they submitted for a reschooling. Because in the culture of discipleship, which I will show you shortly, the essence, which is the essence of this conference, disciples refers to young people. Young people. Young people. People who are, as it were, untrained, like teenagers. So by saying a scribe is instructed, a rich man is instructed, there is something happening here which we will examine. Because it's supposed to be young people. But then suddenly a scribe and a rich man is being discipled. What will have been for teenagers? Stay with me. So, we have seen a scribe as an authority as touching the Torah is being retrained. Then a rich man and in the days of Jesus it is believed historically speaking that there were less than 5% of people that were wealthy in the days of Jesus. So for one rich man out of the few to come and be a disciple. It was a major statement. It was a major statement. I'm talking about historically now. So if one of them breaks the mold. And says. Ah, 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 I need to start again. That's instructive. Yeah. So number one is scribe. Number two a rich man. Acts 14.21. Acts chapter 14. Verse number 21. Mm -mm. Acts 14, 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught, on the line the word taught, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Next verse, next verse. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God through much tribulation. So they taught many, just like Matthew 28 20. Go make disciples teaching. They taught many. So where do we have that in the Old Testament? Are you tired or you still have some energy? Where do we have that in the Old Testament? Let's do some tracing here and establish some fund foundations. The first thing is that the word disciple, which is the word mathetis, which is where we have the word to make disciples, don't occur at all in the Old Testament. If it doesn't occur, occur before the four gospel, interestingly, it's also a non-existent word in the epistles. You won't find the word disciple in the epistles. And you won't find it in the Old Testament. So what then is the issue? The point is, what makes more sense to us in Matthew 28 is verse 19. Of all nations. Of all nations. Of all nations. 
So when we say of all nations, the Old Testament texts are replete with that construction or that instruction to go to all nations or to have all nations worship God. Psalm 22, for example, verse 27 to 28. Psalm 22, 27, 28. Brother, on the computer, I need you now. We're going to run together. Psalm 22, 27 to 28. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before the Lord. Next verse. Shall worship before the Lord. For the kingdom is the Lord's. And he is the governor among the nations. Now, if you back up to Matthew 22, you see that one of the things that happened before 18 is that the disciples went to the mount to meet with Jesus. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. And after worshipping him, they doubted. <laughs> they doubted. And then he upbraided them for their unbelief and gave them the commission. Now, he is the governor among the nations. Matthew 28, 20, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And lo, I am with you always. 28, 20. Matthew 28, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Go to Isaiah 42, verse 1. Please stay with me. Isaiah 42, verse 1. We are tracing this word, make disciples. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Next verse. Verse 2. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Verse 3. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Next verse. He shall not fall nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Next verse. Thus saith the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the heaven and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. Next verse, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will uphold thine hand, and will hold thy hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. For a light of the Gentiles. Look at Isaiah 52 verse 7, 8, 9, and 10. Isaiah 52, we're tracing the word, make disciples. Break forth into, how beautiful upon the mountain at the feet of him that bringeth forth good tidings. That publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion... Thy God reigneth. Next verse. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye. When the Lord shall bring again Zion. Next verse. Break forth into joy. Sing together. Ye west places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He has redeemed Israel. Verse 10. The Lord hath made bear his holy arm. In the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Can somebody shout a good amen? amen? So there's a promise of salvation and worship in the prophets. Okay? The end of salvation is worship. The end of salvation is worship. The reason for salvation is worship. Okay? Now, Psalms chapter 2 verse 8. And everybody's going to read with me Psalms chapter 2, verse number 8. Can we go together? Everybody want to go? Ask of me, and I shall give thee the hidden for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. All right? Now, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts 
chapter 1, verse number 8. And I want everybody to read together with me. Acts of the Apostles 1, 8, 1 to go. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Ask of me, I give you the uttermost part of the earth for your possession. You shall receive power, saying the same thing from the Old Testament to the New, which is a re echoing of Genesis 1.26. A re echoing of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Reading a lot of scriptures, very healthy for you. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Next verse. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now look at the mandate verse 28. Can we all read together? One to go. And God bless them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now that's the mandate in Genesis. So we call verse 28 the Genesis command. The Genesis command. So why did Jesus use the word disciple? Because after the prophets, we had this period where you find people like Ezra and Nehemiah who were committed to building what you call the second temple. The second temple. Ezra, Nehemiah. You know, there was captivity. There was Babylon. And then now, they had people. Because at that point, Israel had been mixed among many nations. They have been mixed among many cultures, languages at some point. Even though they retained the originality of their language, but they had, there was compromise. So men arose who were believers in God's promise and began to re-instruct the nation. Reteach them the law, the law of God, the promise of God. And they were described at that time as scribes. Those who were teachers in Israel. So that evolved like a set of people who began to teach the Old Testament. They began to teach it. They began to instruct it. They began to explain it in details. You had a man like that. A man like that who was Ezra. You had First Samuel. Second Samuel. Then you had the story of 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, now re-explained in 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. Because 1 and 2 Chronicles is a re-explanation of 1 and 2 Samuel. A lot had happened within that period. So Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1, Ezra is a priest and he is also a scribe. Nehemiah, let's read it together. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1. Please follow this background. Nehemiah 8 verse 1. Mm -mm. Nehemiah is somewhere close to Revelation. <laughs> and all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra, they scribe. To bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So there was a reteaching. Are we following? Look at verse 7 and 8 of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 7. Pay attention. Also, Joshua and Bani and Sher Shrebia, Jemin, Akub, Sabetai, Hodijah, Messiah, Kelia, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Pelia, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. Next verse. So they read 
in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the saints and caused them to understand the reading. Hmm. They gave the saints and caused them to understand the reading. Number one, when it says they read the book in the law of God and caused the people to understand, it's the word bin in the Hebrew, B-I-N, bin. The word bin means to discern it. It's used 169 times in the Hebrew Bible, bin, B-I-N. It means to discern it. They cause them to read the book in the law of God and cause the people to understand. Understanding there means to discern. Okay, being. Number two, to discern it, not still number one, sorry, to discern it properly. Look at verse eight. Look at verse eight of that Nehemiah chapter eight. It makes things clear for us. So they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Stay with me. That's the clear light. When he said they read is the Hebrew word quara. Q-A-R-A. Quara. It means to proclaim. To proclaim. That word you find in Genesis 1-5. To call or to proclaim. That's number one. Number two. So that means what he is doing here is proclaiming the book of the law. He is preaching the book of the law distinctly. Parash, the Hebrew word. The word parash there, which means to distinguish. Parash, spelled as P-A-R-A-S-H. Parash, to distinguish. And let me give you the exegesis for your further study. You will find the use of that word parash in Leviticus 24, 12. Leviticus 24, 12. Numbers 15, 34. Ezekiel 34, 12. That word parash means to scatter something. <laughs> to scatter something. And that's exactly what Jesus did in Luke 24, 27. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, the word di daimonia, it means to interpret. He made it clear to them in a distinct way. He made it clear to them, Jesus, in a distinct way. Are you still here? Daimonia, to interpret. So the word parash, there is similar to interpretation. Parash in the Hebrew. Daimonia in the Greek. Then the third word there that was used is the word distinctly. Distinctly. And gave the sense. Distinctly and gave the sense. Is the Hebrew word sekel. S-E-K-E-L. Sekel. It means to judge things properly. To judge things properly. It means prudent, insight, and skill. Prudent, insight, and skill. The word sekel, distinctly. Without much ado, what is going on here is discipleship. All I have described for you from Nehemiah, what is going on there is discipleship. Without the use of the word discipleship. Because he is teaching them to understand it. Number one. He is teaching them to understand it. Number two. He is teaching them to be skillful with it. <laughs> you know, Reverend Kingsley. It's one thing to understand it. It's another thing to be skillful with it. That's right. That's right. Some of you understand the message. But when it comes to explaining it, you lack the know-how. Because there is a skill required in communicating the message. 
So there are two things. Number one, you are taught the message. Then number two, you develop skill in communicating the message. Are we teaching here? Yeah. How to be skillful with it. It's the same word in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise. The word sophizo taken from the word sophia which means skillful. You've known the scriptures to a point of skillfulness where you can meander your way through the scriptures and arrive at Jesus. You can take off from Nehemiah and land in Ezra and assemble all of them together in Luke and arrive at Colossians. You have skill to, to you, you have the wherewithal to meander through the scriptures and arrive at Christ. That is when you have become a true disciple. It takes a bit of time. It's not an overnight job. <laughs> That's why discipleship is a lifetime commitment. You don't graduate from being a disciple. You are a disciple for life. Yeah. While yet being a disciple, you can be raising disciples. And while raising them, you are still a disciple. And they too remain disciples while raising disciples. You get born again in seconds. You remain a disciple for life. Are we teaching here? Uh, you get born again in seconds. You remain a disciple for life. That's why people that are always in a hurry, I have fundamental problem with them. I don't like people that are in a hurry. You have come to learn Christ. You have not even sat on that teaching for 10 years. You are in a hurry to start a, to own a Bible school. What are you going to teach? I know many young men. They, just, they think he's so tied with a, a little Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> this thing is bigger than that. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. You know, let me tell you the truth. The more you begin to understand the depth of this message, the more disqualified you begin to discover that you are. The more unfit you begin to see that you are. Yeah. The, the more it opens up, the more you realize, mm -mm, I'm not ready. I need more preparation. No, I'm not joking. I'm serious. I'm serious. without trying to sound intimidating. At this level of my life and ministry, there's no day I do not study for eight hours minimum. There's no day. There's no day. I'm, I mean minimum. I'm not talking about... Eight hours for me is introduction to study. Every day. I don't have friends. I don't have anything else I'm going out to do. So when I wake up, I pray with my family, play with them, run around for a few minutes, push me, I push you, kick me, I kick you. We jump around, shout. The next thing they see me is in my study. And when I'm in there, I do not step out until 5 p.m. when I'm going to take a shower to hit my pulpit because I preach every day. It's no joke. And it's not what I've done for one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, six years. So it's not coming to scratch your head. I say the Greek word, the Greek word is epignosis. 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 It's beyond that. Discipleship is lifetime. You sit down. And while you are being taught, you also are raising others. It takes time. It takes time. <laughs> it takes time. Except you are going to compromise. Except you are going to. If you are going to compromise, no problem. No problem. No problem. When a man is still excited, he has not settled down. 
when you settle down in understanding doctrine, every atom of excitement disappears. No serious student in the university is excited. You are only excited on arrival to school. When you are phoning everybody, I'm a, I'm a student now of this university. I am a student of this university. When the lectures begin to penetrate, you don't make those phone calls anymore. Some days you are not even happy to go for the lectures. Yet you drag yourself because excitement level is gone. So when you see people that are still excited, they are just warming up. I'm not joking. <laughs> you know, Jesus was teaching and somebody said, Blessed be the womb that bear thee. You know, like you're preaching somebody shout, Glory! Hey, preach it. Tell them. <laughs> Jesus told them, Calm down and mind your business. I'm not joking. Two years or so from now, I'll be 40 years preaching, not reading the Bible. Preaching. Not born again. So I'm not joking. I know exactly what I'm talking about. What you have done for close to 40 years of your life, you should be able to know what you're talking about. Preachers came with me on board. Some of them are back to the, whatever they were doing before. They couldn't last. Not because they don't have a call of God, but because of the discipline required to keep learning. Some are still in the ministry. Nobody's hearing their voice. One of them said to me, it looks like the older you are becoming, the louder your voice is becoming. I said, yes, because I have stuck with the message. I have stuck with the message. When I'm happy, I'm preaching it. When I'm crying, I'm preaching it. When I'm not happy, I'm preaching it. I've stayed with it. Whatever you stick to, even if it is stealing, after a while you succeed. There's nothing you stay with that you don't succeed. It's a principle of life. I don't know if I'm complicating that. Talk. Anything you stay with eventually will work. The only thing that doesn't work is what you don't stay with. Praise God. I say praise God. Are you still here? Give me a few minutes. I'll be rounding up in a few. <clears throat> I want to lay this foundation well so that we can do many things this weekend. Praise God. I say praise God. So he is teaching them number one to understand it. Then number two to be skillful with it. Sophizo. Then number four and cause them to understand the reading. Cause them to understand the reading. The second word reading there is a Hebrew word makra. M-A-K-R-A. Makra. It means a corporate study. Cause them to understand the reading. The corporate study of the scriptures. Cause them to understand. That's what Nehemiah was instructing these guys. So we have seen the background of discipleship. Number one, there is teaching. Number one. Number two, there is interpretation in discipleship. Number one, teaching. Number two, interpretation. Then number three, there is skill acquired. Skill. Number four, there's a corporate worship to discipleship. So I go over it again. The background of discipleship is number one, there is teaching. Number two, there is interpretation. Number three, there's skill acquired. Number four, there's a corporate worship to it. So, where did the word matetis come from? The word matetis is used in the Greek language for an apprentice. Apprentice. But the Jews equally from this practice started to retrain. Just like the Hebrew guys. The Jews also started to retrain people, whether they were young or old. They will retrain you in the law of God. Bring you up in the law of God. So it's like going back to school and starting again. Within the life of Israel, we had this education that was for the citizens of Israel. 
where even though you are a banker, a medical doctor, a farmer, when it comes to the law of God, you start like a child. It was common in Israel. You can be a professor, you can be a banker, you can be a CEO of a, 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 you know, a, a, global, a global corporation. But when it comes to the law of God, you approach it like a child. Like you don't know anything. You keep all of your PhDs and professorship outside. Like you drop the title of apostle at the gate. Then you come into the house of God like a child. That's what happened among the Jews. Please stay with me. Now, so as time went on, because a practice, the practice was from someone in the family of many kids will now be given over to a scribe. Like you have a family of four, five children in Israel. You will take one and give him to a scribe to live with the scribe. The Muslims do it. They learnt it from the Jews. You will take your child and donate him to the scribe. And the scribe will start training them. In Islam, what they do is when they gather those children, the children go about begging for food. Then they come back and sit down. They teach them a surah in the Quran. When they finish teaching them the surah in the Quran with a blackboard and chalk, when they finish memorizing that surah in Quran, they will now wash the blackboard and give them to drink. They will drink that thing they have learned to eternalize it inside them. That's why when they take their bomb and tie it to their body, they, they do not hear go back. Because there's an indoctrination that infiltrates even their blood system. They believe in their religion first before anything. If a Muslim is a president, the first thing he protects is not the constitution of the nation. Is Islam. Is, is, is indoctrination. It's only in Christianity. There is no indoctrination. So if persecution come and they say, are you for Jesus or Satan? He says, Satan, 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 Satan. Because there's no indoctrination. There's no teaching. It's all, I feel, man. You know, you know I feel. Oh, there's an anointing. Uh, I can touch it here. Yeah, yeah, I've just stepped to the third dimension. Uh, what is that? They're not making noise. When the chips are down and reality looks at you in the face, you will have nothing to say. Are we teaching here? It's very important. It's critical to sit people down and drill into their system the truths of the gospel. Where even when you dream, all you're dreaming is the scriptures. Not that you dream people are chasing you. <laughs> chasing you to where? How far can you run with your legs? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Your doctrinal persuasion will determine your subconscious experience. Your doctrinal persuasion will determine your subconscious experience. It's all built on doctrine. It's all built on doctrine. Shatol Abahata. Are we still in the building? So that scribe will now mentor from a child and begin to teach. But their culture, it was something done between the ages of 9, 10, 11, 12 among the Jews. They will train you. Where the young men actually sit at the feet of teachers and they begin to bring him up. Begin to bring him in the law. And I am told that you are taught to quote the law by heart. So something critical here is that there is a strong teaching emphasis. In discipleship, there is a strong teaching emphasis. Back home in our church, every member of our church has been discipled. And every one of them is discipling someone. And everybody has a report card of who you are discipling. Where you are right now. Where are your disciples? Every member of our church. And if we are coming for prayer cruise, 
prayer cruise. We don't call it prayer meeting. We call it prayer cruise. When we say, let's open in prayer, everybody is there with his disciple. You don't tell your disciples pray. You will take them with you. You pray together. They see you pray, they pray. When we say opening prayer, it's three hours. It's after three hours you will hear the next voice. Everybody is the giba, the gobo, the gile, the baga. Disciples are, they, everybody is, is cruising. You don't teach prayer by, by talking. You teach prayer by praying. That's discipleship. That's discipleship. They see you pray and they pray. Then they know that prayer is critical. Are we together here? It's apprenticeship. You don't tell them do it. You tell them see how we do it. Now let's do it together. That's how effective discipleship is. Please, listen carefully. If you have worked before as an intern in any organization, you cannot acquire the experience of an intern by grace. You can't acquire it by grace. You must be found on location. You must be involved. Medical doctors go for internship. And sometimes you're a medical doctor. When you're an intern, you are asked to wash plates, clean the floor, fix the place. You are a doctor. But because you're an intern, you're subjected to other trainings. How many of you have watched the movie Karate Kid? Karate Kid. The boy wants to learn karate, and on arrival, they ask him to wash a car. What has washing car got to do with karate? That is why students don't tell their lecturers what to lecture them. Because the lecture may not look like it is arriving at where you want to go, but the, 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 the lecturer knows what will get you to where you're going. So, the boy begins to wash cars, but he's not washing it well. So, he is rebuked and shown and asked to do it. Why? Because he doesn't see where washing car will affect karate. But first of all, he needs to develop his bicep muscles if he's going to be involved in karate. And the process of developing the bicep and tricep will be the washing of car. So, in apprenticeship, you follow the one disciplining you and follow faithfully. Some things may not make sense. Some things may not make sense, but you follow. <laughs> you follow. It's proper apprenticeship. I'm telling you, discipleship is proper apprenticeship. And we all need to, to learn to have the attitude of an apprentice. It comes from strong teaching, not just inspiration. Strong teaching. Number two, there's a strong learner's attitude required. A strong learner's attitude. So wherever you hear the word disciple, it's not a spiritual word. It's only used for spiritual purpose. Discipleship means apprenticeship. So think of yourself as an intern. If you are not there, you will not see anything. You cannot find an intern online. It doesn't exist. Internship is on location. You can't effectively disciple somebody online. That's why God plants us in local churches. So we can be properly discipled and properly raised up. Online has its limits. It's wonderful, but it has its limits. You can't pregnant your wife online. There are things you cannot do online as powerful as online is. Are we teaching? Are we teaching? God says the solitary in families. <laughs> you have to be there. They will show you real life experiences. 
real life experiences. So here's Jesus with his parents. In Luke 2, 46. Mm -mm. Jesus with his parents. And I will close on this note. Tomorrow we take off from here. Luke 2, 46. Luke chapter 2, verse 46. Are you blessed this today? Luke 2, 46. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple doing what? Sitting. Underline that word. Sitting. In the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Sitting. That word sitting down is the Greek word kate, katezomai. Katezomai. K-A-T-H-E. Kate zomai. Z-O-M-A-I. Katezomai is a continuous tense. Sitting down. Katezomai. You know, there's a way you sit and you keep sitting and you keep sitting. The Greek here means he sat there for long. That's God. God sat down for long under teachers to learn. God sat down. Imagine God sitting down and learning for long. The word katezomai. For those of you that want to look at the use of it in different scriptures, Matthew 26, 55. Matthew 26, 55. John chapter 4, verse 6. John chapter 4, verse 6. John chapter 11, verse 20. John chapter 11, verse 20. John 20, 12. John 20, 12. Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Acts chapter 6, verse 5. Acts chapter 20, verse 9. He sat down continually. He is not restless. Mm -mm. He sat down as if there's nothing else to do. He's not restless. Huh. Continually. He says he was 12 years old. Luke is writing, Jesus fulfilled the scriptures and 12 years is a typical average age of a disciple. What is Luke saying? Luke is saying Jesus is a disciple under these doctors. So Jesus himself was discipled. Jesus himself was someone's disciple. Hallelujah. Hearing and replying them. Hearing them and asking questions. The Greek word apokeresis. Apokeresis. A-P-O-K-E-R-I-S-I-S. -I -I apokeresis. He is, he is giving them replies. They are talking. He's replying. They are asking. He's answering. He's asking. They are answering. He adopts the status of a student. You find him interacting in the scriptures. And when he was found and his mother was complaining and complaining, he looked at her and he said to her, mm, 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 I must be about my father's business. Now the truth is, what he said to Mary here is very cryptic in understanding. I must be about my father's business. Remember he's in the temple. Number two, he's among leaders or teachers of the law. Many others did not understand what he was saying. But Mary kept the saying in her heart. She observed that thing because she knows that Jesus doesn't talk like that. So for him to speak after that manner, she kept it somewhere and observed that saying. She was not a careless mother. She was a very careful mother. And Jesus called the study of the scriptures the father's business. When you are studying the scriptures and learning, you are in the father's business. What have we been doing the last one hour or so? The father's business. <laughs> the father's business. I like scriptural definitions. I like scriptural definitions. 
One day they said to Jesus, what must we do that we may walk the works of God? We want to walk the works of God. We want to walk the works of God. We don't feel used in this ministry. We feel idle. We want to engage ourselves and walk the works of God. Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe on me. You are looking for duty. Faith in Christ is the work of God. The father's business is studying scripture. Scriptural definitions. I must be about my father's work. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I must be about my father's business. Go and make disciples. Let me tell you something. You cannot disciple others when you yourself have not been discipled. It is what you learned while being discipled that you will use to disciple others. A lot of Christians in churches today have never been discipled. They are just church members. <laughs> That's why they can change church any day they like. Because they are not disciples. Disciples don't change their teacher. Uh -uh. Their teacher is their teacher for life. And they are their teacher student for life. But church members can keep changing church. They can move around spiritual prostitution. All over the place. You wonder what they are looking for. They themselves don't know what they are looking for. I said, what are you looking for? I didn't find it there. What exactly are you looking for? I said, I didn't find it there. <laughs> when I find it, I will know. <laughs> Glory! discipleship. Let me tell you one of the things that is missing in the body of Christ worldwide today is discipleship. And that's why it's critical what we're teaching here this weekend. Very critical. Praise God. Say with me, I make disciples. Say with me, I raise disciples. Say with me, I'm committed to the message. And I'm developing skill in communicating the message. So I can make disciples of all nations. I didn't hear a powerful amen. amen. So me, I'm committed to this cause. I am sold out to the assignment. To go to all the world. Raise disciples of every nation. That is my passion. That is my desire. I'm an extension of the kingdom of God in my world. There's a call of God. I'm anointed of God. I have received the mandate. Therefore, I do not neglect this awesome assignment of making disciples all over the world. I didn't hear a good amen. amen. It's not enough to evangelize. Evangelism must become discipleship. You preach you're getting born again. You start Bible study in his house. Don't tell him to come to church. That's not the end point. Make his house the church. Tell him I want us to have Bible study twice a week. Can you create the time? I will come to you. Don't come to me. I will teach you in your house. I will answer your questions. I will pray for you. Let's do that for some weeks. By the time you teach one, two, three, four, five impactful teachings of God's word. He's the one that will say, where is the church? You don't put the church forward. Our mission is not to fill a church. Our mission is to raise disciples for Jesus. But when disciples are raised, they will look for church. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So we are not coming to you to join our church. We are not looking for how to fill our church. Mm -mm. We want you and God to have a vibrant relationship. So we're willing to come to your house and disciple you. And in the process, they are the ones that will tell you, is there no church where we can gather? They will be the ones looking for you. And such people, when they come in, they have come in. And their eyes are set like a flint. Then you begin to see explosion happening in the house of God. Are we learning here? Yeah. 
I told them back home, sharing humbly is not evangelism. You print flyers. Come to our church. Too. That's not evangelism. Handing people tracks is not evangelism. In the supermarkets, products are handed over to people in pamphlets. That's not evangelism. Evangelism where you open your mouth and engage someone and confront him with the truth and bring him to a point where he begins to ask questions and you begin to proffer solution to his questions and you create in him a hunger for more and you teach to a point where he by himself gets a notebook and a pen without you asking him to do it and he begins to make notes they know that you have succeeded in making a disciple you didn't ask him he deliberately made himself a disciple so you teach people to a point where they accept willingly to be your students. Please, that's critical. That's critical. The kind of things we're going to be sharing the next few days this weekend here are things that will cause you to effectively, wherever you are found, build a kingdom of God. Anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your matchless grace. Thank you for your unsearchable gift. Thank you for the opportunity we have to partner with you in the advancement of the gospel, in the advancement of the kingdom, in getting the gospel out to where the people are and raising disciples of his resurrection. I pray that every minister, every man, every woman, under the sound of my voice, these realities resonate in your heart. Your eyes are open to these truths and you are emboldened to declare them. That you receive boldness to make known the mystery of Christ. And I decree that you are kept by the power of God. You walk and you're not weary. You run and you faint not. I decree that the calling and election of God upon your life is made sure in the name of Jesus. Great grace is upon you. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Are you excited tonight? Can we give the Lord a shout in this building tonight? Glory! 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 Amen! Oh, amen! Praise God, I tell you. All right, so tomorrow we begin to answer questions. So if you have questions, you write them down, doctrinal questions, questions on what I'm teaching, questions on things we have taught before, questions from anywhere in the scriptures, you want clarity, you want us to bring you, you know, clarity, just from tomorrow we begin to answer them, and we have a morning session tomorrow, no, on Sunday, Saturday, we have a morning session on Saturday, tomorrow we're back in the evening, then on Saturday morning we're here, on Saturday evening we're here, and uh, God punish the devil on Sunday. <laughs> On Sunday, we're also here. Praise God. Amen. All right, put your hands together. Let's receive Reverend Kingsley to the market. Put your hands together for Papa. Put your hands together. Just shout glory. Shout glory. I want to tell you tonight that tonight is just an introduction. Are you hearing me? So tomorrow, make sure you bring someone along and ensure that they come and feast tomorrow. It's an introduction tonight. <laughs> it's an introduction tonight. I want you to just pray for Papa. He's blessed. He's blessed. Pray for Papa. My goodness, the world was heavy tonight. Pray for Papa. Pray for Papa. And for those of you online, also just pray for Papa. For those of you fellowshipping with us online, pray for Papa.
In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Be seated very quickly. Papa, we thank you. We appreciate you so much. We thank you. That was a word. That was a word. And we are just, ah, to me, I felt like uh, we should do what happened in Acts of the Apostle. Where we just stay throughout the night and <laughs> just enjoy ourselves. Ah, oh my goodness. I wish it never ended. <laughs> Glory to God. Please put your hands together and celebrate Papa one more time. Please, all the IGMA pastors, please ensure you reach out to every other IGMA. I expected that everyone was going to be here today to honor our Papa. In fact, for those of them, I will have to say it here online so they can hear. For those of the IGMA pastors that are not here, you have missed very well tonight. And I just pray that you are here tomorrow. If you are not here, you are on your own. Praise God. And uh, please don't ask us questions when we come to meetings. Pastor Richard, let's ensure that. Uh, don't ask us how it went. Don't ask us to share our notes with you. We are going to try to hide this video from you so you won't see. <laughs> let's just take our offerings very quickly. Take your offerings very quickly. Take your offerings. Take your offerings very quickly.